Hello, and welcome to the Once Again Podcast. We are your hosts, Ashley and Jason. In this episode, we will be looking at the 1997 film, Anastasia. In this series, we won't be doing a deep analysis of the film, or giving a bunch of behind-the-scenes facts, but rather giving our impressions of the overall film and the songs from the film. We will also be giving a score to the film and ranking the songs. So grab some popcorn, sit back, and enjoy this episode. Anastasia is a 1997 American animated musical fantasy drama film produced and directed by Don Bluth and Gary Goldman, based on the legend of the Grand Duchess Anastasia. The film follows an 18-year-old amnesiac Anastasia Anna Romanoff, who, hoping to find some trace of her deceased family, sides with two conmen who wish to pass her off as the Grand Duchess to the uh, Dowager Empress Maria Fernova. (laughs) I did my best. The film shares its plot with the Fox 1956 film, which in turn was based on the 1954 play of the same name by Marcel Mariette. Unlike those treatments, this version adds a magical, empowered Gregory Rasputin as the antagonist. The original film was loosely based on the story of a woman named Anna Anderson, who claimed to be Anastasia from the 1920s until her death in the 1980s. The personal and physical similarities between Anderson and Anastasia convinced many that she was, indeed, the youngest daughter of uh, Nicholas II, but a series of DNA tests performed during the 1990s and the subsequent discovery of the bodies of um, the children and the Grand Duchess herself in the 2000s disproved her claim. Anastasia was the first 20th Century Fox animated feature to be produced by its own animation division, 20th Century Fox Animation, through a subsidiary Fox Animated Studios. It premiered in New York City on November 14, 1997, and was released theatrically in the United States on November 21st. Critics praised the animation, voice performances, and soundtrack though it attracted criticism from some historians for its fantastical retelling of the Grand Duchess. Anastasia had a budget of $53 million, or $99.1 million today, and grossed $140 million worldwide, or $261.8 million today, making it the most profitable film from Bluth and Fox Animation Studios, as well as one of 20th Century Fox's most profitable animated films. It received nominations for several awards, including Best Original Song, Journey to the Past, and Best Original Musical or Comedy Score at the 70th Academy Awards. The success of Anastasia spawned various adaptations of the film into other media, including a direct-to-video spin-off film, a computer game, books, toys, and a stage musical, which premiered in 2016. 20th Century Fox scheduled for Anastasia to be released on November 21st, 1997, notably a week after the re-release of Disney's The Little Mermaid. Disney claimed it had long planned for the re-release to coincide with a consumer products campaign leading into Christmas and the film's home video release in March of 1998, as well continued the tradition of re-releasing their animated films within a seven to eight year interval. In addition to this, Disney would release several competing family films, including Flubber on the following weekend, as well as the double feature of George of the Jungle and Hercules. To avoid branding confusion, Disney banned television advertisements for Anastasia from being aired on on the ABC program The Wonderful World of Disney. Commenting on the studio's fierce competition, Disney spokesman John Dryden brushed off allegations of studio rivalry, claiming, We always re-release our movies around the holiday periods. However, Fox executives refuse to believe Dreyer's statements, with Bill Mechanic responding that it's a deliberate attempt to be a bully to kick sand in our face. They can't be trying to maximize their own business. The amount they're spending on advertising is ridiculous. It's a concentrated effort to keep our film from fulfilling its potential. Anastasia... Uh, was accompanied with a marketing campaign of more than 50 million in promotional sponsors from Burger King, Dole, F- Dole Food Company, Hershey, Cheeseboro Ponds, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, Shell Oil, and the 1997 U.S. Figure Skating Championship. Overall, the marketing costs exceeded that of Independence Day by more than 35%. For merchandising, Fox selected 
Galbod to license dolls based on Anastasia. Many storybooks adapted from the film were released by Little Golden Books. In August of 1997, the SeaWorld theme parks in San Diego and Orlando featured a 40-foot-long, 20-foot-high inflatable playground for children called Anastasia's Kingdom. On April 28, 1998, and January 1, 1999, Anastasia was released on VHS, Laserdisc, and DVD, and sold 8 million units. <laughs> no reaction to Lil' Nope. Okay. Okay. nope. The, the film was reissued on a two-disc Family Fun Edition DVD, with the film in its origi- original theatrical 2.35 to 1 widescreen format on March 16, 2006. The first disc featured an optional audio commentary from directors slash writers Bluth and Goldman. God, I gotta get that and listen to it. And additional bonus material. The second included a making of documentary, music video, and making of featurette of Aaliyah's Journey to the Past and additional bonus content. The film was released on Blu-ray on March 22, 2011. This included Bardock the Magnificent in the special features, the spinoff sequel film. Mm Mm-hmm. Anastasia became available on December 4th, 2020 on Disney Plus, following Disney's acquisition of 20th Century Fox on March 20th, 2019. In the U.S., it was removed from Disney Plus on March 1st, 2022, and transferred to Stars on March 18th, 2022. Contrary to popular belief, the film's disappearance bears no connection to the 2022 Russian invasion of Ukraine. Many people mistakenly considered for years and still consider Anastasia to be a Disney princess, something that the acquisition of 21st Century Fox by Disney made fans speculate about the film's title character potential status in the Disney princess lineup. In 2022, Don Bluth said that he accepts and trusts Disney's ownership of the film as long as they refrain from marketing its title character as just another Disney princess. Fair enough. Directed and produced by Don Bluth and Gary Goldman. Screenplay by Susan Gothier, Bruce Graham, Bob Tudziger, and Noni White. Story by Eric Tuckman. Based on Anastasia by Arthur Lorenz and Anastasia by Marcel Moret. Edited by Bob Bender and Fiona Trailer. Music by David Newman. All songs and melodies were composed by Stephen Flaherty with lyrics by Lynn Ahens. Production company is Fox Family Films and Fox Animation Studios, distributed by 20th Century Fox. Runtime is 94 minutes. It starred Meg Ryan as Anastasia Anya Romanoff. Liz Calloway provides the singing voice for Anastasia. Kristen Dunst as young Anastasia. And Lacey Chabay as provides the singing voice for young Anastasia. John Cusack as Dimitri. Jonathan Dukochitz yeah, provides the singing voice for Dimitri. Glenn Walker Harris Jr. as young Dimitri. Kelsey Grammer as Vladimir Vlad Vasilovich. Christopher Lloyd as Grigory Rasputin with Jim Cummings providing the singing voice of Rasputin. Hank Azaria as Bartok. Angela Lansbury as the Dowager Empress. And Bernadette Peters as Sophie. Very nice. The year is 1916. In St. Petersburg, Russia, a lavish ball is being held to celebrate 300 years of the ruling of the Romanov family. Attending the event is the Dowager Empress Marie, whose son Nicholas is the Tsar of Imperial Russia. Which I never know whether to say Nicholas or Nikolai, because I know in Russia it's Nikolai, or in Russian it's Nikolai. Let's go with Nicholas. Okay. At the event, Marie is happy to see her granddaughter Anastasia, who is sad that Marie will be going to Paris, France. Marie has chosen to give Anastasia a music box as a gift, which plays a melody that both of them know. The wind-up key to make the music box work is on a pendant inscribed with the words, Together in Paris. And I have two notes here, the first one being, for anyone confused and thinking this was a Disney movie, watch how bouncy the characters are. They are constantly moving. Clearly Don Bluth, not Disney. Yeah, I would say that, like... This, like, you could tell this style is more in line with, like, a lot of other Don Booth films. Mm-hmm. And then the song here is Once Upon a December, performed by Angela Lansbury and Lacey Chabert. Mmm, Lacey Chabert. But, <laughs> um, 
I, I, you have no idea how long I waited to, when I put those when I started putting these notes together. I was like, yes, I'm gonna make that joke again. Oh, <laughs> I, God. I wrote down just a few lines, but man, the nostalgia feelings are strong with this one. Seven point five out of ten. Oh yeah, I gave it an eight out of ten. I love this. Yeah, it, it, definitely. This is like one of the things I think about. Like when I think of this movie. Also, for anybody who knows, it's gonna question me. I go hard for every single one of these songs. So we're in for it here folks yeah if uh if my fanboying over batman mask of the phantasm annoyed anyone uh just strap yourself in folks because (laughs) you're about to get tenfold of that for ashley with this movie the mood of the party is soon silenced as rasputin enters claiming to be nicholas's confidant nicholas instead brands rasputin as a traitor and orders him out of the palace Angered at Nicholas, Rasputin claims that he and his family will be dead within a fortnight, and vows to not rest until all the Romanovs are dead. Rasputin then sells his soul for the power to destroy the Romanov family. With his stronger dark powers, Rasputin uses them to cause dissent among the people, who soon revolt and charge the palace gates. Anastasia and Marie are in a room in the midst of the chaos, but escape through a secret entrance with the help of a servant boy. As they attempt to make their way across a frozen river on the palace grounds, Rasputin confronts them, but ends up on thin ice, which cracks and gives way under him, causing him to sink into the cold waters, leaving behind his magic reliquary and a little albino fruit bat named Bardock. Ah, Bardock is... love him. Yeah. Anastasia and Marie attempt to board a train, but in the process, Anastasia loses her grip on Marie's hand, falling to the platform where she hits her head and goes unconscious. And I have a small note here. I just wanted to point out that Anastasia calls her grandmother Grandmama. And I rather like that than just grandma or, you know, anything like that. It gives an old world and royalty feel to it. Yes, it it does. Yeah. Ten years after the revolution, St. Petersburg is filled with gossip that Anastasia may still be alive. With the Dowager Empress Marie who still resides in Paris, promising to pay a reward for the return of her granddaughter. And here we have the song A Rumor in St. Petersburg, performed by Jonathan, how did we say it? Uh, Duch? Dukachitz? Yes. Jonathan Dukachitz, Kelsey Grammer, and a chorus. And I wrote that it's fine for the first real song of the film, because the first one was just a few lines. Uh, but I never noticed how different uh, Jonathan Dukachitz's voice is from John Cusack's as a kid. Now I couldn't help but hear it. And I still give it an 8 out of 10. I gave it an 8 out of 10. I love a good opening village song. Reminds me of Belle from Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. Another one of my favorites. Like, I like a good opening village song. I'm with you on that. I yeah. agree. And I also wrote down that in Don Bluth fashion, every goddamn background character was dancing throughout the song. Way more animation going on here than uh, what Disney films were doing in the past and still at this time in 1997. You know, yeah. your, their background characters are very stagnant. But yeah, it, 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 again, another sign that it's a Don Bluth movie. A lot of moving animation going on. A con man in St. Petersburg named Dimitri and his assistant Vlad are attempting to find a woman to pass off as Anastasia in the hopes of bilking Marie out of the reward. I believe it was 10 million rubles. Meanwhile, Anastasia has grown up in an orphanage under the name of Anna, having developed amnesia after falling off the train onto the platform with no memory of her past life remaining, except for the key slash locket to the music box. The head of the orphanage has deemed it time for Anna to go to work and sends her off to work at a fish factory. Anna soon comes to a fork in the road, with one way leading to the town where the fish factory is and the other leading to St. Petersburg. Unsure which way to go, Anna is surprised when a little puppy appears and seems to lead her to to St. Petersburg. Uh, I love Puka so much. I have a note here. Uh, it's it's in two minutes. Uh, not even two minutes. So I'm just going to... We have the song Journey to the Past, sung by Liz Calloway. And I wrote down, I haven't watched this movie in literal decades, but this was another song that just fueled more of the nostalgia trip. And I wrote down that maybe in the top ten animated songs from the 90s. Uh, I gave it a nine out of ten, but I still think a fantastic song. I gave it a 10 out of 10. I love this song. Okay. This is such a good song. Let, let me bump that up. 10 out of 10 from yeah. both of us. All right. You can't give this song a 9 out of 10. Fair enough. 10 out of 10. I'm pretty sure the song won awards. Like, if it didn't, it should have. Yeah. I'm sorry. 
And I also wrote down that Liz Calloway actually does sound like a singing Meg Ryan. And good job to the voice casting on this one. Uh, just because I was so shocked by how different Dimitri's yeah. talking voice and singing. It was really jarring to me. And I have a further note here saying, also, we constantly go back and forth on who the best Disney dog is with every Disney film that we watch. However, I think we can firmly state that Puka is the best Don Bluth dog. For now, at least. <laughs> maybe maybe we'll come across one in the that. future. But yeah. Once there, Anna attempts to take a train to Paris, but is denied transit because she does not have an exit visa. A woman who hears this tells her to see a man named Dimitri, who she claims can help her. Anna is informed that Dimitri can be found near the now-abandoned royal palace, and soon enters. Once inside, she is overcome by various memories as she enters the now-dusty Grand Ballroom. And here we have the song Once Upon a December, sung by Liz Calloway. And I wrote down, awesome song and amazing storytelling through the animation. 10 out of 10. Oh, I love when all the ghost dancers show up. It's just perfect. Yeah. 10 out of 10. <laughs> I agree. Suddenly a voice rings out, and Anna finds herself face-to-face -face with Dimitri and Vlad. Looking at her, Dimitri feels that Anna would be, the perfect, would be perfect for his plans, and convinces Anna that he can help her get to Paris if she will accompany him and Vlad, and Vlad to see the Dowager Empress and see if she may really be the missing Anastasia Romanoff. Naturally, Anna goes along with the plan, having no knowledge of who she really is. I have two notes here, the first one being Kelsey Grammer should actually consider a career in voice acting. He's really fantastic in this movie. He actually sounds like Russia, like a Russian, not just doing a bad Russian accent or no accent like most of the cast. Yes. And my second note here was that, according to Vlad, the name Anastasia means she will rise again or resurrection. In the classical Greek, yes, it does mean that. But in real life, during the 20th century, it had an alternate meaning uh, being the breaker of chains. Mm -hmm. So they could have had uh, Anastasia Tar Targaryen instead oh. of... <laughs> Daenerys. But... Anastasia Romanoff, first of her name. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which, um, uh, in doing research, I, there, I have a bunch of real world facts about this, but evidently Nicholas II was considering getting rid of um, male Prevagen in the line of succession. Mm -hmm. So it would have been, I forgot the oldest daughter's name, but she would have inherited the throne. But with all of them having been killed, if Anastasia had actually survived, she actually would be the heir to the Russian Empire. But, eh, it is what it is. Meanwhile, in a little alcove of, of the ballroom, Bardock has been hiding and notices Rasputin's reliquary has started to glow. As he lays a hand on it, it suddenly rockets the little bat into limbo, where Rasputin has been for ten years. Since Anastasia survived, he was not able to die completely, and has been stuck in limbo as a rotting corpse. When Bardock presents him with a reliquary, Rasputin uses its power to conjure minions to destroy Anastasia. Here we go. We have the song In the Dark of the Night, sung by Jim Cummings, and I wrote 10 out of 10. I started with my score. I said it slapped so hard. Go ahead. Hey, honestly, best villain song in existence. You cannot tell me otherwise. It's so good. 10 out of 10. Yeah. I remember being so scared of Rasputin as a kid, but like this song... This is my jam. Like, yeah. if you want to feel like a badass, just put on In Dark of the Night and I'm troll around your house. <laughs> I'm going to give a caveat. I'm going to say that Hellfire... Uh, Hellfire is Hellfire is up there. And so, um, uh, Be Prepared is also up there. Another one sung by Jim Cummings. <laughs> um, I, I think most of that... Just have Jim yeah. Cummings yeah. sing all villain yeah. songs. Yeah. Who knows? Winnie the Pooh <laughs> makes, makes great villain songs. <laughs> Oh, bother. <laughs> like, 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 bother. Um, but uh, I, I do have a note here that said, if I had to nitpick, Jim Cummings doesn't sound exactly like Christopher Lloyd, but it's not as shocking as uh, Jonathan Dukachitz and John Cusack. It's, it's close enough. Uh, you're so funny. Yeah. Anna, Dimitri, and Vlad board a train headed for Paris, but end up having to hide in the baggage car when their uh, passport's coloration is overheard not to match the proper color. I love that joke, too. That Vlad, he's like, oh, this country, they like everything red. <laughs> like, you know, so upset. I cracked up at it. And Rasputin's minions also intend to derail the train, but our group manages to escape before it plunges into a cannon. So I have a couple notes here. The first one saying, 
Vlad's little book with a count of who wins and the exchanges between Anna and Dimitri. Yes, that yeah. was so good. Yeah, I laughed out loud. And then also Vlad's line of saying, oh no, an unspoken attraction. Again, I laughed out loud. I think Vlad might be my favorite character. The group continues on foot with Vlad telling of the Dowager Empress's first cousin, Sophie, who questions anyone claim, claiming to be Anastasia. Anna gets uh, indignant that no one told her she would have to prove that she was Anastasia. Vlad convinces her that there is nothing for her back in Russia and that Paris could hold something special. His words convince her and they begin going over proper etiquette and Romanov history. And here we have the song Learn to Do It, sung by Jonathan du du eh, Dukuchitz, Kelsey Grammer, and Liz Calloway. And I wrote that it's probably the worst song of the film so far. That being said, it's still good, and I gave it a 7 out of 10. I gave it an 8 out of 10. I like the song a lot. Again, uh, it would I just like clean to the song and stuff. I enjoy every song in this stupid movie. I'm yeah. sorry. No, I, I, I think it's still a great song, like a good, a very good song. I, I think it's the worst one of the film so far, but I, it's still good. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't think it's bad. I, um, eventually, they take a ship from Germany to Paris, where both Dimitri and Anna perform a waltz, which seems to bring the two a bit closer together. And here we have the song Learn to Do It, Waltz Reprise, sung by Kelsey Grammer. And I wrote, you gotta have a little sadness in your romance, especially in a Don Bluth movie, especially in the 90s. So... Uh, while it's only a few lines, it's beautiful, and I gave it a 9 out of 10. Same, 9 out of 10. Uh, yeah. Somebody sing this to me in my romantic moments of that, life. That's the thing about this song, too. Like like I said, it's only, I think, 8 lines or some, maybe yeah. maybe 10 at the most. But, like, you could, you just have to take out him saying his name Vlad, and, like, you could put this for anything. Like, yeah. it could be a romantic song between two people. It could be, like a father looking at a daughter like it like it, it it applies to a lot of different scenarios that evening rasputin invades anna's dreams and causes her to almost sleepwalk over the edge of the boat until dimitri saves her after the two setbacks rasputin decides that he will return to the living world and deal with anastasia himself bardock reluctantly follows and i wrote down two notes personally i feel that rasputin invading anna's mind is a level of darkness that we haven't gotten from Disney films to this point. And I think Disney writers and artists would be light would be lying if they didn't admit that Bluth's films caused a major shift in what they were uh in what they put out going forward. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah. And a bit of trivia is that in Anastasia's Nightmare her father calls her Sunshine, and this was her actual nickname from her family, the real Anastasia's nickname, I should say. Anna, Dimitri, and Vlad eventually make it to Paris, unaware that the Dowager Empress has had enough of various imposters claiming to be her granddaughter and has decided to forego the search. I love that all the imposters that show up at all these things, too, because they're all silly looking. Yeah. But, like, like just variations of, of Anastasia. Like, they, yeah. they, they could be, but just off a little bit. Just moments after this decision, Anna and the others arrive at the Empress's mansion, and Sophie answers the door. Even though she has been privy to the Empress's wishes, she still questions Anna. Eventually, the questioning turns to how Anastasia was able to escape from the palace. Dimitri thinks that they will be found out, but is shocked when Anna explains that a young boy opened a secret passage for her and the Empress to escape through. Sophie explains that Anna appears to have answered all the questions correctly, but explains about Marie's wish not to see anyone else. Vlad insists that Marie must meet Anna, and Sophie hints that Marie will be attending a performance of the Russian ballet that night. Sophie then takes the three of them shopping for new clothes. So here, I have, first have a piece of trivia that Anastasia's wardrobe totals to be over ten dresses, which constitutes the greatest amount of attire of any character in the film. Honestly, in a lot of any films, to be yeah. honest, like when you think of what Disney princess has more than like two outfits. Snow White wears the rags and then her outfit for the rest of the movie. Yeah. Cinderella wears her rags and then the rest of the uh, Yeah, outfit they for really the only movie. have like yeah. a couple of different. Yeah, I can't think of another one. Well, I guess you could argue Aurora because it goes back between being blue and pink. Yeah. And her Briar Rose outfit. 
and her baby swaddle. <laughs> yeah, that's like three, though. Yeah, like, we're not talking like... No, yeah. That, uh, ten is a lot. Um, it, and I, I, I like... I forget what cartoon show did this now. There was some cartoon show that was on Netflix, but in every episode, the characters wore different clothes. Like, as mm-hmm. if it was, like, real life. Like, you don't wear the same outfit every single day of your life. Yeah. But uh, anyway, getting back into this. And we also have the song, Paris Holds the Key to Your Heart. I remembered... I thought I was going to say Paris, but I remembered it's Paris. It's performed by Jonathan Dukachitz and Bernadette Peters. And I wrote down full-on Bluth animation, blurred watercolor backgrounds, and every character is constantly moving. The song itself is okay. I gave it a 6.5 out of 10. I gave it a 7 out of 10, and it's probably one of my least favorite songs of this film. Not that it's bad, but... Yeah. Also, it's just a lot. Like, this animation sequence is just all over the place it is. compared to a lot of the rest of the movie agree later that evening dimitri takes vlad aside and explains that the escape story that anna told is true and he is sure that their intended imposter is the real anastasia telling vlad that he was the boy in the story however i love his moment by the way of being like she is the real one yeah <laughs> like yeah but he, they, we found the real one exact yeah however their talk is interrupted as anna arrives and they go in their box in the opera hall during intermission, Dimitri and Anna go to the Empress's private box, where Sophie allows Dimitri to meet with the Empress. However, uh, Marie explains that she has heard about Dimitri and knows about his schemes to deceive her. And I wrote down that I love the way that Angela Lansbury says, Timbuktu! And it, it like, cracked me up, like just the way that she said it. I don't know what it was, but it made me laugh. And Dimitri is thrown out, having failed to see that the door to the box was partially opened, and Anna hears the entire conversation. Dimitri tries to explain who she really is, but Anna storms off and heads back to to their residence. Dimitri waits until Marie leaves the opera house and then takes the place of her chauffeur, driving her to Anna's residence and demanding Marie see her. Marie still refuses until Dimitri produces the music box that she had given Anastasia long before, and the music box was left behind after Marie and Anastasia escaped through the secret door. Marie then gives into Dimitri's wish and talks to Anna. Anna explains that all she wants is to find where she belongs. As they talk, Anna shows Marie the locket she has, and when Marie produces the music box, Anna's memory fully returns and Marie is overjoyed that she has found her granddaughter again. And here we have the song Once Upon a December Reprise, performed by Liz Calloway and Angela Lansbury. Just a few lines, but a very powerful and emotional part of the movie. I gave it a 7 out of 10. Oh, I agree. So emotional. 7 out of 10. Love right. it. Right. And then Marie... And then, oh, sorry. and then Dimitri is a true man. Go ahead. <laughs> Just go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Marie Marie eventually calls on Dimitri, presenting him with the reward and her gratitude. Even so, Dimitri refuses the reward, but is glad that he has reunited Anastasia with her true family. Ugh, such a romantic. As he leaves, he encounters Anastasia, and the two exchange a few words, with Anastasia believing that Dimitri has gotten his reward after all. Later on that evening, Marie and Anastasia are in attendance at a social function in, in Paris in which Anastasia will be uh, revealed to those in attendance. Marie explains that her granddaughter should be happy, but seems somewhat distant. Marie knows that Anastasia secretly loves Dimitri, and explains to her that he did not take the reward. Marie goes out to join the, the festivities first, telling Anastasia whatever path she chooses should make her happy. After Marie leaves, Anastasia is distracted by Puka, which leads her out to the garden near the building. As she makes her way to the nearby bridge, Rasputin emerges from the fog and attempts to kill her. However, Dimitri, having had second thoughts, returns and tries to save Anastasia. In the process, Anastasia manages to get hold of Rasputin's reliquary and destroys it, causing the mad monk to finally be destroyed. In the aftermath, Anastasia and Dimitri confess their feelings for each other and elope with Anastasia choosing to forgo her royal heritage for love, much to the delight of her grandmother, who declares it a perfect beginning for two young lovers. And I wrote down, I love how Anastasia and Dimitri don't finish each other's sentences throughout the movie. They each know what the other one is thinking, and it doesn't have to be spoken. 
Exactly. They are such a good couple. Oh. I just and I love how like Sophie and the grandmother are just like ah, they eloped. Yeah. <laughs> like they're just so happy. Agreed. And Bardock concludes the film by getting a pink fruit bat girlfriend who he kisses and then pulls down the movie screen saying uh, while saying so, so long, long everybody <laughs> so long everybody to the audience i think i went more borat with that than, <laughs> than uh, bardock but eh, close enough and then during the credits we actually have three songs the first one being at the beginning sung by richard uh, marx and donna lewis and i wrote down ed cr- end credits uh, feature the song it's fine six out of ten i um, love this song yeah, I so say, much i said this is, my car. Yeah. this is one of my favorite songs ever 10 out of 10 All right. <laughs> 10 out of 10 the second song is journey to the past sung by Aaliyah, and as the second end credits song it's just a cover of the song from the film but it gets a bonus point for uh being Aaliyah who sings it so i gave it an eight out of ten i agree eight out of ten okay and then the last song is once upon a december sung by dina carter and I wrote, damn, a lot of end credit songs. <laughs> uh, good cover and very well sung, 7 out of 10. What, you don't like it when we go hard for the credit songs? Also gave it a 7 out of 10. You know, it's, go. <laughs> it's interesting. I don't know what, like, I had to get the song list from a couple different websites because not all, they weren't all on the same one. But this one was interesting, and I'm just guessing it's a cover in a different language because it's, I can't pronounce mm-hmm. any of that. Um the Hahe Te Impo Atras. Yeah. Probably. Parentheses Journey to the Past. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing it's a Spanish cover of it, maybe, perhaps. I don't know. Tiempo. I think that's. Tiempo. I think that's Spanish. Tiempo for would time. either have to be Spanish or. It, tiempo could be. Brazilian? Or not Portuguese or something? Yeah, maybe. it could also be some, like, Italian kind oh, of yeah, thing. Oh, yeah, that's too. true. A romantic language. And then I also have some trivia here. A lot of it's depressing, though, so I don't know if I really (laughs) want to read it. You don't have to read all of it. Okay. Uh, Just a small thing. The historical Anastasia was 15 rather than 8 at the time of the revolution and 17 at the time of her death. So, uh, as previously stated, as a result of Disney's acquisition of the 21st Century Fox Entertainment assets, Anastasia is now considered by many fans to be a Disney princess. Do you hold her as one, or...? I don't really think of it like that. I mean, if Disney decided to like do something with the IP, I'd yeah. understand. But Disney has not done anything with the IP. Disney does not sell Anastasia products anywhere. Which greatly surprises me. Yeah, like I don't know if that's out of respect because obviously Don Bluth has stated that he does not want them to treat her like a regular Disney princess. But I'm sure at some point we will get something with her. Yeah. I just... Until that time, I, you know, she's just a Fox acquisition. Like, Maybe. you know, it's the same people that are like, Princess Leia is a Disney princess. No, she's a Star Wars character. Yeah. She might be a princess, but she is not part of the lineup. Which I argue her status as a, I don't understand the titles in the Star Wars universe at all. She's mm-hmm. a, she's a princess because her father's a senator. How does I don't that understand. Make yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I think... They're probably waiting for Don Bluth to die so that there's no complaints. Because I'm sure they would love to do a live action of this. And I'm sure they'll do something for the 30th anniversary. I'm sure they'll do something. We're mm. just not... They're just quietly not doing anything right now. Yeah. Which is fine. They don't have to do everything with every acquisition they've made. But I think we will get something. I just don't know when that will be Who know, maybe five years from now tim allen month will become anastasia month <laughs> it'll come down blue month <laughs> yeah possibly Let's... and you know i also think of it in terms of like disney's been in a weird spot anyway i mean with Iger back who knows maybe some <laughs> will happen now yeah possibly uh contrary to popular opinion anastasia's hair is auburn rather than red nevertheless one shade can be at time and can at times appear to be more prominent than the other however the real anastasia had strawberry blonde hair mm. so a final note that a more accurate translation of her title from russian to english rather than being grand duchess would have been grand princess um that's all the trivia i'm going to go over because the rest of it's pretty depressing yeah <laughs> so let's move into our overall scores then would you like to go we'll, we'll go, go first. yeah I, I went first for or yeah, you went first for batman so i'll go first here <laughs> So, I wrote down strong nostalgia vibes with this one, but I'll try to be objective for my review. 
Is there anything that I can say about a Don Bluth's animation style and movies that hasn't already been said by someone else? No. So I'll just reiterate that I firmly believe it was Don Bluth's films that forced Disney to make better movies themselves, and thus launched the Disney Renaissance. So thank you, Don Bluth, for providing a young Jason with quality entertainment, both directly and indirectly. Secondly, this film made me realize that I'm getting softer with age. As a kid, I liked this movie because the animation was great, the story was cool, and the songs were awesome, but it didn't pack the emotional punch for me. Now it does. I actually had tears in my eyes at several points throughout the film, both happy and sad, and was shocked that the movie did that to me. However, it's not a perfect movie. I have to admit that while I love that Don Bluth has his characters constantly moving, I, it can get distracting and at some points even annoying. It might just be that I was paying attention to it this time, whereas in the past I didn't, but there were points where I found myself saying, Jesus Christ, even their freaking hair is moving. And as previously stated, some of the voice actors and their singing counterparts were uh, so jarring that I have to consider it when giving a score to the film. Also, the plot. I'm fine with a revisionist history for a narrative purpose, so long as it isn't damaging to a group of people. So sure, make Anna really be Anastasia. Rasputin caused the communist revolution? Okay, whatever. My main criticism of the plot is the climax. It just felt like the writer said, Okay, we need to wrap this up, so Dimitri comes out of nowhere and punches Rasputin, yada yada yada, Anna crushes his orb, yada yada yada, ha happy ever after. It was lazy in my opinion, which sucks because the rest of the movie is fantastic. I'm not sure what I would have done differently, but it just felt very rushed. All in all, I'm giving Anastasia an 8.5 out of 10. It would be a 9, but I'm docking at half a point because of how the climax of the film made me feel. So, let me ask you something before I start getting into like mine, because I do agree with you that the climax is very, like, it leaves a lot to be desired. Do you think that's because they did add Rasputin in as, like, a character? Because I think the thing is, the rest of the story has nothing to really do with Rasputin ever. Rasputin's almost like a plug-in at a lot mm -hmm. of points. Not saying I already know, you already know I love his song, but, like, he's just kind of there. Yeah. Like... Well, we discussed... And recording. even all the stuff yeah. he does is very magical, but, like... The characters aren't really re re reacting to that. They're like, oh, that's weird that that all happened. But they're not like, oh my god, Rasputin's using his magic against us. Yeah. Like, he's not really the antagonist at any point. It's like, yes, he's there, but he's not there consciously with them all the time. And even at the climax, he basically has to tell her who she who he yeah. is for her to re re exactly. Oh, yeah, you're Rasputin. Like, yeah. yeah, like, like he's not... Like, his point being there is meaningless, and yeah. maybe that's the problem, is, you know, you get a nice wrap-up, like, but you need something to bring Dimitri and Anya together at the end so that yeah. they go off and do their honey like, go off into their honeymoon phase, but, like, what else is there besides Rasputin yeah. at that point? Yeah, the film needed a villain. It and... needed a villain, and they took someone who had a loose association with the Romanov family, who was already well dead past this point. Yes. Uh, but it has, like, some... Uh, he, I, I think of Rasputin as, like, the Russian Nikola Tesla. Like, he, yeah. was a, he was a genius on a certain level, and because of that, like, people didn't understand his level of thinking. Yes. He was thought of, like, as this great wizard. Like, mm -hmm. I, I would equate Rasputin to Nikola but that Tesla. But that would be my, like, only thought process there is by deciding to add the magical element to begin with mm. they kind of backed themselves into a corner where they couldn't have the story the way it needed to be told at the beginning like because this is based off of things so yeah. like if you're trying to base it off of that and then adding a weird magical element they didn't really dive into that magical element enough to make it the forefront of the plot. Yeah, and, like, from there... Because the plot is still just get Anastasia to be her. Like, get her to, like, Anya to fake it, basically. Fake it till you make it. And <laughs> from the characters in the film's perspective, when Rasputin shows up, it's just like, what the hell is that? Like, what's going on? Like, ah, this guy's still alive? Yeah, like, like, what is this? Like, are, are like, because nothing could, couldn't be reasonably explained from their perspective. The train went out of control, derailed, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. They didn't see the little demon bats flying around. Yeah. Uh, when Anna was sleepwalking, she was sleepwalking. Yeah. Like, like, it was nothing that, like, there was no direct interaction that he was 
there the whole time that they would know about until yes. the very end. So it was just like, yeah, just wrap it up. Like, yeah, like, yeah. I, I don't know. So I, I think I it definitely is a good movie, but I think that's why the end feels so kind of like canned almost because they don't have anything to work with. with they did that to themselves. Yeah. Which, you know, I, I will. What they should have had was uh, Rasputin is defeating both of them, Anna and Dmitri. And then the ghost of uh, Lenin comes out and oh, grabs God. grabs Rasputin and drags him back down to hell. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Make it even weirder. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry. So, that being said, I do love the, all the music in this film. It is definitely one of my favorite films from growing up. And, you know, besides some of the animation and storytelling things, it's just a great film. And I gave it a 9 out of 10. Okay. Neither one of us has seen the uh, Broadway adaptation, but we were... We have not. Yeah, you know, I was listening to it in the car when I was waiting to pick up Ashley before... And I was like, oh, I can't wait to hear In the Dark of the Night. Like, I want to hear this Broadway. And I'm looking at the playlist, and it's not on there. And I was like, where's In the Dark of the Night? And it sent me on a Google search. And I went to the Wikipedia page for the Broadway musical adaptation, and Rasputin's not in it. They have mm-hmm. a, a different character. That, um, I can't remember his name right now, and I wasn't even saying it correctly to begin with. But he's a Bolshevik who uh, basically has to kill Anna but also falls in love with her. And I was like, that could be a more interesting dichotomy. Like, if, if they were to But re- you can't have that in a kid's movie. Like, that's... Yeah. I, I kind of understand. Yeah. Like, what we're saying. Like, the problem is, is they took the base material and then turned turned it into a kid's movie, which is where you get the magic from, because you need yeah. to have some sort of villain, because you can't have just a Bolshevik. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That doesn't work. I suppose to like some Russian children that would yeah work that very would work well. there. I, yeah, but... I, it doesn't work in American media. Yeah, is what I like. Western media media is what my thought process was. Yeah, I guess you're right. But if they did, if Disney did decide to do a live action adaptation, I would like them to take that element and bring it in because I think live action rescue would be even weirder than having it here oh i'm sorry unless, I, unless... I would love it i think there's ways you could do this story very well with mm. the rasputin still being in the way he is but like like i said you basically need to like go full ham with the magic stuff going on okay um and i guess should we address that um we didn't really dive into much of the real world history because it was mm-hmm. it's too much to cover yeah and, I personally, Do your own research, folks. Well, I hate that phrase, but I also I also personally don't feel like doing that going forward with other historical figures that we're going to talk about because it's a lot with them too, and it makes me sad when I, when I when I read about the differences between what really happened with those characters and <clears throat> I mean, <laughs> yeah. It, but even the trivia here about the Romanov family, like I skipped over most of it because I was like, oh, this is sad. This is like, and I don't, I'm not saying the Romanovs were great. They obviously weren't. Yes. You know, your people don't lead a, lead a revolution against you if you're great. No. But, but, but uh, it was just, I, I draw a line at kids. Yeah. And it, it was kind of just no. sad to read about it. And yeah, exactly. Pocahontas, the real history there is also very depressing. You might not so. like it, but again, if you really want to know, look it up. Yeah. Figure out about it. Agreed. I watch stuff like this all the time, so, like, I already knew a lot of this stuff. Yeah. But with all that being said, this has been the Once Again Podcast. Sorry to leave you on a down note, especially for the the last film of Tim Allen Month. Um, (laughs) But uh, happy conclusion to Tim Allen Month, folks. Um, (laughs) Any questions, comments, or critiques can be addressed to our email at onceagainpod at gmail.com. Follow us on our social media accounts, once, once again, pod, all one word, on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. If you'd like to contribute to the podcast, we have several tiers available on patreon.com slash onceagainpod. As always, a like, follow, or share would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, and have a wonderful day. And remember, we will entertain you. We will always entertain you.
Rumpelstiltskin always says that magic comes with a price. But for this price, you can get a nice piece of jewelry. Use code ONCEPOD for 10% off your first order at Unusual Magic Jewelry on Etsy. Click the link in the description.